Hello Rebel, hello Gman9, welcome along to another whole nine yards. This is the week eight recap of course, and boy oh boy do we have some stuff to talk about this week. We will start, we'll get stuck straight in, as we always do, and we'll start with the performance of the week. Now, for the first time ever, performance of the week, not even going to a team who won their game, and you'll sort of see why in a little bit. Um, but this week's performance of the week actually goes to the watch. The Orcs have uh, thrown a right old spanner in the playoff chase with a pretty good result for them, you have to say, against the Wood Elves of Sabretooth Vag 3.0. We can see that result now. It was 1-1. And uh, MB Carmack dropping points for the first time in a while. He'd been on a bit of a tear with three or four victories on the bounce. Um, but Alzir, despite that rough patch that we know he's been going through, has managed to pull out a very creditable one-all draw here against uh, against the Wood Elves. And nobody will be happier with this than Jubisak. Um Alzir probably has a beer coming his way from the Dwarf coach because, of course, that allowed the Dwarfs to extend their advantage at the top of the table. It wasn't even a particularly casualty heavy game. There was one uh, badly hurt that I think was apoed actually for uh, Sabretooth Fadge and then a dead rookie lineman who had four out of six SPP. Um, but no levels for the Orcs, no levels for the Wood Elves in this game and two dropped points for Sabretooth Fadge means that uh, they, they've fallen a little bit behind that all important first place. You see the Orcs pretty much dominating the ball possession. That'll have been a long, slow drive, likely enough in the second half. Um, and pro you probably would imagine the back end of the first half, but unable to convert that into a touchdown. Uh, but 26 blocks, absolutely nothing in the way of removals for the Wood Elves. One of those games for them. They say they didn't lose too many pieces, but at the end of the day, Alzir was able to drive the ball through for the one-all tie, and it's a great result for him. Uh, and this really goes to show as well that just because you're out of that playoff chase doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have a massive influence on this division. Still plenty to play for. And hey, if you can't qualify yourself, what better role to play than be the role of a spoiler for somebody else? So that is exactly what Ozzy has done this week. So with that in mind, here are the rest of your week eight results. They look a little bit like this. So... From the top, Aaron Elfos 2, Sci-Fi Sorai 2, Hack and Hack Slash and Mutilate 0, or nil if you prefer. Uh, we'll start it again because I messed that up, didn't we? Hack Slash and Mutilate nil. Owen does Requiem 1, another victory for the undead. Uh, Quigwana's 1, the Boondock Skinks 1, Honours even in the Lizard Off, as we anticipated it might have been. And while we're on the subject of 1-1s, one Sabretooth Fads 3.01, The Watch 1. Shock and Gore 1, Bloody Mary Queens 1. Sneaky Blinders 1, Chosen of Papa Nurgle 1. 1-1 one, one week, apparently, in G-Man Division 9. Uh, five of our seven games ended in a draw. When I was putting the graphic together, I got lovely copy-paste work out of that one there. Um, and the final result... Of course, as you can see, it's another victory for the Big Cups. This time, 2-0 against Hubat. Juvisak really is marching on. So, we begin at the top. And I actually did receive a message from Cthulhu Collector this week to say, hey, guess what? Didn't lose this week. And, yeah, we're damn right he didn't. It was a 2 all draw with Aaron Alfos. And, boy, did he cause some damage as well. This is how the game looked. So, you can see there a MVP for Gedioth, the Blitzer, who had Dodge and Dauntless. He picked up Strip Ball from this, uh, which is turning that into a rather nice Blitzer. And uh, Robert A. Heinlein here is now one casualty away from another level on that Soros, which is great news. 15 armor breaks producing a fairly substantial one kill, four injuries, and two KOs when you consider it was only 28 blocks producing those 15 armor breaks. So Cthulhu's Collector's Saurus not messing about at all here. Uh, but at the end of the day, the game ended on as even. Um, 
Yeah, so there we go. It's not really, obviously, a great result for either team. You would expect that uh, both would have wanted to win. As it, as it happens, it leaves them both right down the uh, the bottom end of the table, really, and very much just looking for development for next season. But to be fair, on, on both teams, certainly on Cthulhu Collective's team, there's plenty there that would have you looking at next season and say, yeah, keep this team going. There's plenty of scope to uh, to improve them. We've got some Saurus developing very nicely indeed. They do take a long time to get there to, uh, to Saurus. Um, but, yeah, just having a look over the team in the background. We've got a strength five Saurus, of course, with Mighty Blow. Uh, Robert A. A. Heinlein there, who is a couple of SPP away from another level. And then Block on all of them. Guard on one, Guard on two, sorry, and Dodge on another. So a, so a lizard man team, sorry, that is developing very nicely and not forgetting the Guard and stand firm on the Croxigo. Uh, for Aaron Alphos, it's a slightly different story, and we're going to come back to them later on, because uh, Cthulhu Collective made a bit of a mess of these Dark Elves, has to be said. Uh, the second game is an unfortunate defeat for the humans again, hack slash and mutilate still without a win this season as we, we go on with that long, long wait. Um, it's a 0-4-4 record for them now. But headline news is the absolute tear that Erwin does on at the moment. Three wins on the spin now. And uh, he's been around Rebel for a long time, has Erwin Dahl. Uh, coaching uh, certainly an Orc team in the past. And then there was, a, I believe, a Nurgle team possibly in the Reckoning as well. Um, oh, and Chaos as well. He's, co he's coached a Chaos team back in the day. But uh, this certainly the best form I've ever seen him in, in all of that time. And that goes back as far as Season 3. We, we managed to level up the Block Guard Mummy, which is brilliant news. A casualty getting the job done there. Um, and alongside that, also managing to level up his Guard Zombie 2 for good measure. But it is a great run of form for Erwin as Requiem. Clearly, of all the teams he's played, Undead suiting Erwin or better than all the rest. So it's great to see because he's stuck around Rebel for a long time and has never really had uh, great results or any real sniff of a playoff chance before. Uh, but I tell you what, I'm, I'm totally not showing you the game in the background here, am I? So that's what we're going to do now. Let's get that up for you. Uh, a 1 0 win for the Undead, of course. But yeah, this is the first real shot that Erwin Dawes ever had at playoffs. He's in that race for the first time. So delighted for him. Uh, Gordon Smutzer here, very much a former human who was, unfortunately for him, very much killed in this game. He was actually a lone alignment who then signed, as it happens, for Owen's Requiem and picked up the MVP for good measure there. So, um, Hack Slash and Mutilate, unfortunately, taking another loss. Um, and just a few badly hurts. There was nothing major in the way of damage to the team. Did manage to level Percival, their rookie blitzer which is uh, good news and something to work with. I'm just checking what he picked up. He picked up Mighty Blow, so we've got another potential killer there, which is good. Um, a nice, solid choice. But, as I say, a great result for Ermendor. Right, let's talk about some 1-1s, because, you know, when you're a recapper, there's, there's, you, you like to talk about interesting games, right? And when your entire division decide to just draw 1-1, it makes your life a little difficult. So... How about a Lizard Mirror, which finished 1-1? How do we feel about that? So there's Quigwanas and the Boondock Skinks for you. Um, the, the Lizard Team scored. And then the other Lizard Team scored. And then we all went home. 12% ball possession for Quigwana, suggesting it was a very quick score for them. The Boondock Skinks, not really fair and much better. Not entirely sure what we were doing here. Maybe it was just a big old Lizard Brawl. Um, and the Skinks very much not knowing what to do with the ball when they managed to get a hold of it. But you can see, spoiler alert, we do have a player of the week from this game. And that player is... Uh, um, is Chicks. Is Chicks is your player of the week for week eight. And uh, picking up, as you saw in the background there, 12 SPP in this game. But, but Zord, it, it finished 1-1. Obviously, we take off five for the MVP for the Player of the Week award. But 
But a touchdown's only worth three. Yeah, this skink decided to just kaz two of the other lizards. Straight up casualty them. So you can't argue with that. Um, you don't see it too often. But yeah, um, in fact, I go further than, than a kaz. He actually bloody killed one of them. So, dead skink. Private iguana dead to the hands of another skink. That's a sidestep skink. Dead fork iguanas there. Uh, so if you if you're playing is chicks anytime soon, beware because never mind is it a movement nine sprint skink, but he's also got a bit of a temper, and uh, will will kill your players if you're not careful. Uh, Gex here, by the way, for Quiguanas, leveled as you can see. A skink seemed to have a habit of doing in this division, and Gex picked up sidestep. So well done him. Not the most exciting thing in the world. Didn't roll a double, but. Uh, you know, better to have sidestep than not, I suppose. But at the end of the day, 1-1. And in the race to be the top lizard in this division, um, no one no one really taking that particular bowl by the horns. Um, 10th, 12th and 13th are the three lizard man teams. So not a great season for the three lizards we have in G-Man division. That, and that is certainly for sure. Okay, so we've already talked about Sabretooth Vag 3.0, getting that one-all draw against the Watch that's really hampered their playoff chase. Uh, so we'll move on to Shock and Gore against Bloody Mary Queens. Now, this was, again, in the playoff race, a game that both of these teams kind of needed to win and is a game that neither of these teams has subsequently won. However, however, one of them has a much better chance of making it to playoffs than the other now that doesn't look too bad does it nine armor breaks that's five armor breaks there four passes one death oh no um, we're going to come back to the bloody mary queens because they're going to feature prominently in the injury report again so at the end of the day shock and gore did manage to level up uh, two of their ghouls actually and we're going to go and look at both of them because they rolled quite well in the in the uh, development report so kind of a hold your horses on this one we'll come back to this game later because things happened we did actually catch by the way the, the sort of back end of the first half of this on friday night rebel i believe it was um in fact no it was on crusaders stream on a, on a saturday or sunday morning uh he was waiting for a big o game to start and we caught the end of this where on turn eight shock and gore just spite bolted the uh the elf with the ball who was in scoring range but didn't actually have another turn to score uh gruff entirely miscounting and just flat out bolting the mighty blow catcher easy name for Harringsord, who had the ball and injured him so that was a thing didn't actually help in terms of getting the ball back but uh, injured a high elf and plenty of that went on you'll see later guess who drew 1-1 one, one. Lava Jackal, we need to have a word, buddy. Um, this is becoming all too common. We, I've, I've been saying for weeks, you need to kind of stop drawing games one all and maybe win a couple. Because, yeah, you're the only undefeated team in the division. But uh, I'd be more impressed with a 6-0-2 record right now than 3-5-0. That makes sense. So if it, it seems at the moment like if the killing doesn't quite happen, then... Uh, and the answer's not quite there when it comes to turning these draws into wins. But there's still time to work it out. Here's how the game went down. 16 armor breaks this time for the division's kill machines. Uh, Sneaky Blinders, though, putting up a good fight. Aromasin can be happy with this result, you have to say. Um, in the end, a very good point for him. And continues both of these teams' streaks of just drawing all the time. Uh, both of them now on five draws. And... Maybe they're in a race to see who can draw the most games. I don't know. I'll need, I might need to do some research into what the most drawn games in a Rebel season is because both Aromasin and Lava Jackal seem determined to claim that particular record. Um, the most wins in a season, I know, that's 12. No one's ever done 13. But we have had a couple of 12-1-0 seasons in the past. Um, but in terms of draws, no, I've got, to, I've got to go and do some research on that one. But these two both now on five. And 
how did it go? Well, even in the block game, which is surprising, actually, considering um, you'd expect the Nurgle to just be all over the underworld here, trying to cause casualties. Uh, but as far as Lava Jackal's concerned, it seems like, as I say, maybe if, you know, if, if he's attacking first, maybe he's not uh, able to score or something, and, and then he's having to equalise in the second half. Or if he's defending first, perhaps he's not causing enough damage before the opposition are able to score. And then there's not enough time to remove everything and score twice. Either way, it seems like some sort of change of approach might be needed somewhere to uh, to try and improve these results. It, it's great that you're undefeated. Not losing Blood Bowl games is the the first step, really, to getting into playoffs. But at the same time, five draws is really too many. And if he wants any chance now of going to the playoffs, he has to win every single game, I would say, between now and the end of the season. He's seven points behind Juvisac with only five games to go so that's 15 on the table you need a collapse from the Dwarfs as it happens the Big Cups are still to play against Chosen and Papanogel so he has some influence in that himself but we need, really need to start winning Blood Bowl matches soon ok final game for the week is of course those Dwarfs the Big Cups I don't know what to say at this point really they've won again um, Hubat didn't have a great day. 27 armor breaks from the Big Cups. Absolutely massacring. Poor old Paolo B's vampires who managed just a measly three armor breaks in return. However, Count Amadan the Vane here is now within MVP range of leveling to level six. Now that's an AG6 blodge vampire. If we can get pro on that thing, great news. Um, and, and really with the way he's developed... Obviously, the Agi 6 means you can't get much in the way of core skills. Now, with Vampires, you do... If you look at Random Boy in Division 1, um, if you're looking for Vampire tips, he is absolutely the man to go to in Rebel for for Vampire tips. He's the only Vampire coach to make playoffs, and he's done it twice, and he's made the quarterfinals both times. Um, so, if you look at his Vampires, you'll see wherever possible, by the time you get to level 5, level 6, he's picking up Pro just to try and cut down on those bloodlust rolls because again as you start getting more developed your opponents are more able to kill those thralls and the last thing you want to do is kill them yourself as well because it's going to make your life difficult but in terms of this game the the big cups are marching on and i'm almost losing track of how many straight wins that is now is it are we up to five or six now it's uh, i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to find that out because it'll bug me if i don't know so it's uh, week eight was a win week seven was a win week six was a win week five was a win week four was a win week three was a win and week two was the loss to the watch so yeah that is now six wins in a row for Alzir uh, not Alzir sorry for Juvisac who is beginning to stretch his legs clear at the top of G-Man Division 9 it is pretty much in everyone else's court to try and catch him now not my job I'm just here to tell you all how well he's doing. Uh, but whatever it is, if you guys want to stop these dwarfs going to the playoffs, someone has to do something about this winning streak soon. Because as it is, the big cups are running away with this. Having said that, in terms of upcoming fixtures, there's still some big, big games for them. Um, with all of their all of the big rivals still to play. They've got uh, the match against Sabretooth Vag 3.0 in week 12. That's one week after they play Lava Jackal, the Chosen of Papa Nurgle, in the final week of the season. Well, they've actually got the Dark Elf. So it's two major rivals out of their um, last four games. They do have Shock and Gore this week as well, so another rival there. If they pick up results in those games, that'll be the ones that uh, Juvisac's targeting for. Maybe at least draws, because even if he doesn't get all three points, you're denying your opponent the chance to catch you up. So... All to play for, but Juvisac's almost there. We've only got five weeks to go. Someone has to do something soon if we want to stop these dwarfs going to the playoffs. Okay, so time for the injury report, which is sponsored by the Bloody Mary Queens. Or what's left of the Bloody Mary Queens. Remember how I said this team would be really, really nice if it... If it could just survive the season. It would have lots of AG5. You'd be able to develop it really well. <sighs> mm. Oh dear. So, 
we have a dead. Hawthborn Guavathar. The only one I could say, he's dead. And he's a zombie now, so at least he gets to live on on Shock and Gore's team. Uh, but he's gone. That's unfortunate for him. Um, straight up dead. Nothing we can do about that. You'll also spot a strength up on the RG5 Wrestle Tackle there, Maldirian the third. A strength up, sorry, a strength bust. He's he's not looking good. So decisions to be made about whether you keep a strength two high elf catcher with Wrestle Tackle. Wrestle Tackle in RG5 is really nice. Strength two. Not so much. His job is to sack the ball. And unfortunately, he just became considerably less good at doing that. Uh, elsewhere, the strength 4 blitz has taken a movement bust. Now, we can probably live with that, given the state of the rest of the team. So, Lanlathian and Domiel will probably be okay with movement 6. That one isn't the end of the world. Especially considering his strength 4. It's actually quite a nice trade off that. But... It's Meldiri in the third there who's the big decision to be made. I don't know if he can keep that around. He has one job in the team, and that is to sack the ball. And I, I don't know how good he is at doing that anymore. And the RG5 is kind of bloaty as well for someone who's not that good at their job. So perhaps we just bin him off and start again. But certainly decisions to be made for Soulforge. He's had a rough old couple of weeks. It was all looking so good. And then he's gone shopping at the wrong armor store. And suddenly, not looking very good at all. Right, so, uh, not the results, sorry, injury report. Amateur hour. Speaking of dead elves, we have to go over to Aaron Alphos, the dark elves, who, as I said, were kind of mangled by the sci-fi Sorai. So, we, uh, the team is now looking a little bit like this. So we've got a couple of MNGs. It's actually not much worse than MNGs, but those uh, those players will be missing for the Week 9 fixture. There was the Assassin's Dead, old Rayo Paciante. He is unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, Witch Elf was badly hurt, and that Leap Blitzer took a badly hurt as well in the game. But it's an MNG for the rookie lineman. Not a massive deal. A lone alignment's pretty much as good, to be honest. And um, we've also got an MNG for the Tackle Blitzer, which considering Skinks are around next week, the only Tackle being out, that is not good news at all. Uh, Gedioth did manage to get Strip Ball, but the Skinks do have Sure Hands, so we need to find a way to get rid of that Sure Hands player. And if we can't do that, then suddenly the Strip Ball player becomes much, much bigger threat. But until then... The Lizards do have an answer to the main Dark Elf threat of getting the ball turned over. Um, the team, again, isn't too bad. You might consider you've got an armor value 8, but Niggle, this must be... Oh, no, it's an armor value up, armor value down player. Not sure how keen I am for that. To be honest, with Blodge and Leap, Dark Elves are quite... It's quite quick to level a Dark Elves Blitz if you really want to. You've just got to feed him a couple of touchdowns. You can get dodge again. And then you're pretty much back to where you started. But that's kind of 30k of blow. It's not really giving you too much there um, on Kaeldar. So I would consider firing that player. Especially considering for the 170k, if you end up down that compared to an opponent, you maybe pick up a wizard. And you might be better placed to take advantage of that depending on the team you're facing. All right, final injury from the injury report, sponsored by the Bloody Mary Queens, is from Irwinder's Requiem. And there wasn't really much to choose from here. There were so many deaths that but the deaths were all kind of like rookies and zombies and whatnot. Um, but we do have an MNG for one of the tackle ghouls here, Elmar Lehepu. Now, he is armor value six, this ghoul. I've got to be honest, he's got two sure hands ghouls on the team. We'll go and have a look. We've also got Alexander Steiner here. Now, that's, even though we've got an armor up, which again, I don't like, because you could have taken another movement up with that and been really, really quick. Um, he is niggled, but at the same time, we do have one sure hands ghoul. I don't think we need two sure hands ghouls. There's only one ball. So he's kind this guy's can't mean he'll be doing nothing next week regardless. But he's still very much not really achieved. If he's got the ball, don't know what he's doing. So with armor value 6, I'd probably can him and save yourself the 130k TV. Uh, you've got a fresh ghoul you can start again with here and see what you roll. 
Uh, Charles Francois Tepper's very good player. Tackle strip ball does lots of useful things. But this one, not so much. And with Alexander Steiner knocking around, I think uh, this is a much better player to get rid of. Okay, a token look at the development report graphic because we're sticking with the same team. Because that guard zombie has leveled Giovanni Mazzacci. Now, we took Wrestle. Now, that to me is not quite the right choice. Block sounds boring, but block is... Uh, it's good. Block guard is really, really nice on zombies. It's just that extra... You, the thing with guard is you want guard on its feet because guard on the floor isn't doing its job. So when you take wrestle, of course, if that both down is used against you, yeah, you take the opposition player down as well, but you also put your own guard on the floor. Now, sure, on the next turn, you can stand up, but you want guard on its feet for as long as you possibly can. And, of course, players with Juggernaut can cancel that wrestle as well. He also managed to level Helmer McCurry, as we said, the mummy. Now, he's got stand firm, so we've got two block guard stand firm mummies, and this one has dodge as well. That is frightening. Anyone coming up against that is going to have a bad time. And this probably goes a lot to explaining why Erwin does on such a tear at the moment. He's got two players there that he can really lean on. And combined with the strength four mighty blow white, he's got a very, very nicely, um, nicely developing undead team, especially in this division where there's not much that can really deal with this. So Erwin does Requiem coming on very nicely indeed. And apparently it's undead week or something. Because we're now going to have a go uh, over to Shock and Gore. Because Gruff managed to level two of his ghouls. One of them has rolled a strength up. So we were talking about the fact that he took guard on that wrestle piece. And yeah, you didn't really want it on the wrestle piece. As I was for the same reason I was saying before. But when you get offered a chance of guard, you kind of have to take it. And then, well, wow, all of a sudden, we've been offered a strength up. So you're asking yourself the question, hmm, do I kind of have to take that? And it seems like Gruff has decided, yes, he does. So that has become a very weird ghoul. Wrestle Guard and Strength 4 is not a combo I'd ever say I've seen before. Um, we did pick up Sidestep on the AG4 ball carrier as well. This is a very good ball carrying ghoul. AG4, Sure Hands, and Blood Step is pretty much ideal. If he makes it to 76, you'd probably consider something like Fend on a normal, um, just to stop Frenzy players from having a second go. And all that jazz. And to stop him being piled on as well. Assuming he sidestep correctly. But Shock and Gore finally looking like they, they're able to develop a couple of players. Stanislav, Danislav with guard these days as well. So it's nice to see this team not completely mangled. Famous last words. Uh, the final one will seem pretty boring. But it's, uh, it's something at least worth talking about anyway. So it's actually a dwarf longbeard. Ugh. Dull. Here's Akar, who, of course, plays for the big cups. Now, rather than go the standard guard and mighty blow route, he's actually gone, because he rolled a double for dodge, he's now picked up stand firm afterwards, which I really like as a decision. Because the fact that longbeard comes in with built-in block and tackle, Suddenly, that thing, if he goes and stands next to something, is very difficult to get rid of. Um, there was a clan league game I played against Kanuki uh, and his Kemri team uh, just a week ago, I think, where I basically won that in overtime because I had one bludge firm longbeard that was able to stand in between four players. Obviously, Kemri and Raji too, so they weren't ever going to dodge away. And they just couldn't roll a pow to save their life. And that player taking up all of that, uh, all of those dice, all of that, all of those hits, just meant that my other players were able to run around and win the game for me. So this can be, if you can position him properly, you probably won't throw him in to the wrong spot too quickly. But he's also not quick enough to be a safety. So it's just about making proper use of him. But his potential to be a major, major pain, especially against elf teams, for example. If you get that tackle into play, and then they can't easily block him away without rolling that pow. So, Akar, want to keep your eye on if you're playing against the big cups. All right, development report done. 
Time for the form guide, and would you believe it, the dwarfs are still at the top of that. Because when you've won six in a row, it's very difficult for me to shift you. But joining them this week with three wins in the last three are Erwin does Requiem. Delighted for Erwin as I said before, to see him doing so well this season. Um, Sabretooth Vads 3.0 dropped from the win streak with the draw, but still good enough, just ahead of Shock and Goal, based on Countback, to be in the top three. And with so many draws recently, there was a bunch of teams on two points from the last three games. The Watch end up in this bottom three on the count back because they lost three in a row prior to this. Um, but the Boondock Skinks and the Sci-Fi Sorai also down there with just a one point from their last three games. Both Mundingo and Kazuto Collector struggling to get points on the board at the moment. And the Lizard Man teams generally not having a great time of things. Despite the fact that the teams aren't looking dreadful, certainly the Sci-Fi Sorai have scope to uh, to improve the results um, in terms of you know the, the development of the team. It's not like they're miles behind on development. It seems like it's all there. So it's just a couple of play decisions, I think, from Cthulhu Collector that you just need to tighten up on. And then those results will start rolling in. Um, so we'll move from that on to the league table. And again, it makes great reading for the big cups. That's now a four-point lead over anybody else. And, of course the best touchdown difference in the division. I had to actually lower the font size to fit in that plus 10. So it's a four-point lead over Sabretooth Vibes 3.0. Irwin does Requiem moving up to a very creditable third place now with a 5-1-2 record and 16 points. And then it's the chosen of Papanurgle and Shock and Gore who are still borderline in the race fingertip stuff i'm gonna go out on a limb now and say that the bloody mary queens are pretty much out of contention mainly because they are eight points behind and don't really have a team to speak of so soul forged that's probably too big of an ask now to catch up that gap to the big cups with five games left you can get to a maximum of 28 but that would require five wins out of five and then of course requires everyone else to not reach 28 so the Big Cups are still in a good spot. I mean, as it stands, Sabretooth Fadge can, what, with five wins, they can get a 32. So, officially, we need 12 points to get there. That would get us a 33. So, four wins from the last five, and nobody can stop Juvisac. And that is... We can, we can talk about that officially now. So, if you get... As long as the Dwarfs get to 11 wins, there is nobody that can stop them claiming this playoff spot. And that's the advantage they've given themselves now. With a four-point lead, they can afford to drop a game. They won't want to, but if they were to have a bad week, a dicing one particular week or whatever, and did lose a game, they still have that cushion in hand now. And it's the first time this season we've seen a team with a buffer in that playoff position. So looking good for the big cups. And we'll see, as we look at the fixtures now, whether they can keep this up and make it seven wins on the spin. So here we go. Aaron Elfos, having been murdered by a Lizard team last week, get to face a Lizard team that are slightly higher in the table. In fact, one place higher in the table. Uh, Quigwanas are in town, and Aaron Elfos will um, be hoping that it goes better in terms of injuries than it did last week. They got a two-all draw, so if they can just prevent that second Lizard touchdown from going in, they could pick up a win there. 11th versus 12th, two teams focusing on development now rather than any, any of the, the playoff chase at the top. Hackslash and Mutilate taking on Bloody Mary Queens. Now, Soul Forge, as we said, he'd have to win every single game if he wants any remote chance of the playoffs. And based on the league table, this is the best possible fixture he could have picked up against the bottom of the table side. But at the same time, this against a fairly broken high elf team that are now missing quite a few key players this could be a great opportunity for Jonah to get that first win and we I personally really want him to get that before the end of the season it'd be awful for him to go through the entire season without picking up one victory so we'll see if he can get it here against Soul Forge but Soul Forge is a good coach it's a big ask Sabretooth Vadge 3.0 I think we'll be confident of picking up a result against Cthulhu Collector um, obviously dropped a couple of points against the watch last week but this is probably a good fixture for them to attempt to put this back on track uh, the sci-fi saw i haven't had a win for quite a few weeks now in fact their last win came back in week four and in fact that was their only win of the season back in week four 
against the humans, hack slash and mutilate. So, yeah, I mean, as I say, that's a, I'll try it again. That's a lizard man team with a uh, good source of element. So there's a chance for Cthulhu Collector to do some damage to the elves, but at the same time doesn't have any strip ball. So we'll need to make sure that the um, the movement nine sidestep and sure feet skink Zoltenksor, whatever he's called, is kept safe. Uh, because those elves are going to be going to be coming straight over the top of the Saurus cage to try and have a shot at that ball. So position of the guard is going to be all important. Right, this is the big game of the week. Shock and Gore taking on the big cups. And Shock and Gore are out of this if they don't win that game. If they do win that game, they are really, really right back in the race because they will reduce the gap to Juvisac to just four points. And of course, we'll allow everyone else the chance to catch up as well. Close that division right up. But Juvisac here has the chance to basically eliminate, and by basically eliminate, he will literally eliminate a, a competitor from the playoff race if he can win that game. Uh, with a victory against Shock and Gore, he would move 10 points clear of Gruff's undead team with only 12 available for the undead to catch up. And consider another team can still pick up points as well. You'd have to say that Gruff would be out of that race. So... That would be a nice target for the Big Cups. A chance to reduce the number of teams that can catch them if they can pick up a win here. But a couple of good mummies on that undead team and uh, the chance to maybe break some of that dwarf armor that we haven't seen broken for quite a while now. They've been on a charge recently. Um, so tough one to call, but based on the win streak, you've got to go with the dwarfs in the, uh, in the prediction game on this one. Ninth versus eighth. Next, Sneaky Blinders taking on Hubat. Uh, that game has already happened, so it's pointless me making a prediction. Um, other than to say, I believe it was actually quite an entertaining watch. It was cast on Aromason's Twitch channel, which I believe is just twitch.tv slash Aromason, so feel free to check that out if you want to see a replay of that game. Um, but with that one already being played, we'll move swiftly on to the Boondock Skinks taking on Erwin Does Rack We M. Now, can Erwindor make it four wins in a row against the Boondocks Kings? Well, he'll be fancying his chances. The Lizards haven't... None of the Lizard teams have done particularly well against the undead counterparts this season. So another great opportunity for Erwindor to make it four wins in a row. And again, it's this is one of those games that he needs another win from if he wants to keep up that pressure on Juvisac. If he was to win and the Big Cubs were to lose then Erwinder's Requiem are within two points of that playoff position. So that is how much rides on these fixtures now. It's uh, it's hotting up with only five games left. And one bad result somewhere can really allow a lot of teams back into the picture. The final match is The Watch taking on Chosen of Papa Nurgle. And that one is going to finish 1-1. The Watch have drawn the last two games 1-1. Chosen of Papa Nurgle have drawn their last two games 1-1. And as much as I tell him not to do it, Lava Jackal insists on drawing Blood Bowl matches 1-1. So, <laughs> joking aside, there's um, it, it's a tough one. It's not a, it's a scary game for for the Orcs, this. Because, of course, all the Claw Mighty Blow can really... If it starts to get through their armour, it can really cause them a lot of damage there. Um, but... That's what Lava Jackal really needs. It's, it's going to be a one-all grind unless he can get proper good removals on that Orc team. But it's been a while since Zolzir had a win, so again, it would be nice to see him pick up another victory and a chance to actually claim another scalp. If Lava Jackal loses, that's pretty much him out of the playoff race as well. But to be honest, at this point, a draw is no good to him. If he wants that playoff position, he needs to start picking up victories now so that he can keep himself in contention. All right, guys, that'll wrap it up for uh, another episode of The Whole Nine Yards. Thank you for watching, as always, and good luck to everyone in Week 9. We are really reaching the business end of the season now. Uh, we will be back after all these fixtures are said and done to let you know how it went. I believe a lot of the matches are actually being um, played over this weekend. Um, if You can find all of this information out on rebel.net. Um, if you just go to rebel.net, there's an upcoming games button where you can see all of the games that are being played live as long as the games are put on the site of course 
Um, but Shock and Gore are playing against the Big Cups tomorrow at, uh, at 16 o'clock UTC, so 4 p.m. UTC, that one. Uh, and we've also got at 10 p.m. UTC, uh, or 2200, Sabretooth Vag taking on Sci-Fi Sorai. And then on Sunday at 8 p.m. UTC, the Boondocks Kings are taking on Irwinders Requiem. So that really, that's kind of all the big games, with the exception of the Watch and Chosen of Papa Nogle, which does take place on Monday, that one, at um, at 1900 UTC. So there you go. If you want to see all of the playoff chasing teams, you can catch them all over the next three days, the 19th, 20th, and the 21st of, uh, of January. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to stream any of the games, unfortunately. Triple Cup is on the menu for me tomorrow, and then we, I've got to go away for a work thing for a couple of days, so I won't be able to do any of that. But uh, as I say, plenty to be watching out for on Twitch, and Gruff, I know, has been streaming a few of the games, so keep your eye on the Discord. And until next week, have yourselves a good one.